Hello, and welcome to the Dental Learning Center. I'm your hostess Dr. Marie Huggy. Today we have is our Partial Dentures Designer Maxillary Kennedy Class 2 Modification 1 Arch. With me today is the inimitable Dr. Homer Goon. Hello and welcome Dr. Goon. Our title page features Dr. Goon as a young child obsessed with eating. Your buddy stick figure isn't here, so we have your favorite banana creme pie. Will someone please bring Dr. Goon another napkin? Well, we'll have to start the segment while Dr. Goon stuffs himself. Maybe he can join us later. Our patient is presenting today with a partially edentulous arch. She would like to replace the missing teeth if possible. Her dentist has informed her that due to maxillary tooth loss, her mandibular teeth could erupt further, making her situation worse. She has a Kennedy Class II modification 1 arch form. Oral examination reveals the presence of a small inoperable palatal torus. The anterior teeth contact end to end. The mandibular dentition is intact with the exception of missing third molars. While the periodontal condition is excellent, the patient does have frenal attachments which will interfere with the placement of bar type clasps. The patient routinely listens to Dr. Stick Figure's motivational tapes for instructions on perfect living. The patient is happy with her appearance, but has had endodontic treatment on the maxillary incisors and the condition of these teeth is stable but questionable. Our first task is to obtain accurate diagnostic impressions, mount the casts accurately on the articulator and survey the maxillary cast. To determine the path of insertion, we will examine the arch for potential guide planes, heights of contour, retentive undercuts, interferences to the path of placement, and the impact of aesthetics. We will examine the articulated casts for areas of habitual occlusal contact. Subsequently we will plan tooth preparations for guiding planes, axial recontouring, and rest seat preparation. We will perform these preparations on a duplicate diagnostic cast to verify the efficacy of our proposed tooth modifications. Any existing partial dentures will be examined and the patient's subjective opinion will be considered in our plan. Splendid Marie, splendid. Why thank you Dr. Goon, I'm glad you're able to join us. Oh I was referring to the bye. Dr. Goon. Our first tooth modification would normally be to establish guiding planes. Guiding planes are parallel proximal surfaces used to guide the partial denture on insertion and removal. They are normally conveniently prepared on teeth adjacent to the edentulous areas. Yes, the preparations usually consist of a simple enameloplasty, and are flat so gingivally and curved buccolingually. Normally. Guide planes are short on teeth adjacent to an extension base area, and long when adjacent to a tooth-bound area. Why is that Dr. Goon? Loading the distal extension base could cause binding of the guide plane and trauma to the tooth. A short proximal plate should produce less potential for binding the tooth when the partial denture is in function. Tooth-bound areas are less likely to produce this effect, thus the proximal plates may be made longer. Dr. Goon. I believe your lecture on various clasp assemblies delves into this concept. Okay Dr. Goon. It seems as though we'll be using suprabulge clasps owing to the fact that the patient has frenal attachments which could interfere with placement of a bar clasp. We've marked the height of contour of the abutment. What's the deal here? Well Marie, these clasps are simple to use and usually won't give you any trouble if used correctly. However, the origin and rigid portion of the cast circumferential clasp should engage the tooth in the middle one-third. This is impossible if the height of contour is in the occlusal one-third, as it frequently is. Therefore, minor enamel plasty, with all due consideration to tooth preservation and aesthetics, should lower the height of contour to the middle one-third for the bracing portion of the clasp. 
Of course, the flexible retentive tip should be in the ginger view one third. For purposes of illustration, the ding plas are in blue, and areas to be recontoured are in red. One should mark these areas on the diagnostic cast. The abutment teeth in this example are examined on the articulator. We prefer that areas of rest preparation are not located in areas of habitual occlusion. If possible Marie, we locate the rest seats as indicated in the diagram. These locations are easily accessible and may be conservatively prepared. The marginal ridge reduction is 1.5 mm. These rest seats are spoon shaped with the deepest portion about 2 mm. Forming the rest seat in this way will direct forces down the long axis of the abutment tooth. It is important to avoid preparations that act as inclined planes. Once the fulcum is located, we can identify the location of the indirect retainer. Here, we see that the bicuspid rest is ideally situated to function as the indirect retainer. Selection of the major connector is limited by the presence of the inoperable torus located in the palate. Dr. Goon, what are our options here? We have room for a posterior strap of about 8 mm in width, and lateral straps of 7 mm minimum width. I believe that the anterior posterior strap will do nicely here, as it is more rigid than the U-shaped major connector. It is not necessary to plate the anterior teeth but doing so will facilitate maintaining the serviceability of the partial denture in the case of unplanned tooth loss. Most maxillary major connectors should have a bead line which helps keep the connector in intimate contact with the tissue. Because the palate is covered by keratinized tissue a half a millimeter bead cast into the framework usually does not cause irritation to the tissue. In this case the bead line is formed at the terminal end of the framework, as well as around the window. The laboratory technician is not responsible for determining the location of the bead line. The dentist should ideally mark this line on the master cast after location of the vibrating line. Normally, the extension base will have ladder retained acrylic for a base material. Short, well-heeled, tooth-supported areas will have a beaded metal base. Dr. Goon, is there any reason to deviate from this standard? In this case Marie, based on the scenario, I don't see any reason to change. We weren't given any data on possible space loss which could present a problem. Let's leave it as it is. OK Dr. Goon, how will we retain this partial denture, in terms of the direct retainers? The frenal attachments preclude the use of bar-type clasps. Although surgery is a possibility, we determined that aesthetics was not an overriding factor. On tooth number 4 we have placed a mazeal rest and assumed a 0.01 inch undercut is present on the mazeal. I would suggest using the cast round circumferential clasp. The round clasp configuration has improved flexural characteristics over the half round clasp. Dr. Goon, could we use wrought wire? Yes, provided that there was a 0.02 inch undercut present. And what about number 15? On the tooth bound side, the retentive area of 15 is located posterior to the fulcrum line, and aesthetics is rarely an issue. A standard half-round cast clasp engaging a distal 0.01 inch undercut is by far the simplest and easiest clasp to employ. If correctly made, these clasps tend to be very reliable. But do recall, Marie, that we have recontoured the axial surface to ensure that the rigid portion of the clasp lives in the middle one-third. Quite so, 
Dr. Goon, a factor all too often overlooked by the novice. Now Dr. Goon, the class pawn number 12 requires special consideration. Indeed it does Marie. You see, the entire tooth is anterior to the fulcrum line. Any and all clasps will apply traumatic forces amplified by a first clasp lever. Ideally, we would not place a clasp on this tooth, but normally raw wire is used here. Some other options include non-retentive bracing clasps, or cast round clasps with minimal undercut. Let's leave the viewer with the raw wire, traditionally drawn in red, and normally soldered to the framework. Are there situations when he could not use the raw wire? Well, in some cases there is simply inadequate space to solder a wrought wire. In other cases, sufficient undercut is not attainable. I must say, Goon, that you can give our viewers something besides heartburn. Ha ha ha. Okay Dr. Goon, last but not least we need to reciprocate these clasps. Marie encirclement of the abutment is important to make sure the retention is reliable. In this case we have three types of reciprocation. On number 4 we have the distal proximal plate and mesial vertical bar minor connector. When using the mesial rest, it's important to avoid things that could shift the fulcrum line distally, such as plating. On number 12, we have no such concern, and use the lingual plate for reciprocation. With number 15, we keep it simple with a circumferential clasp recalling how important it is to locate these elements in the middle one-third and avoiding occlusal interference. Dr. Goon, that's about all the time we have. I think we've covered this design, are there any final comments for our audience? If I'm not mistaken, Dr. Elmer Stickfigure will be broadcasting his new motivational show, How to Get Out of Bed Correctly from his new location on the West Coast. OK thanks. For the Dental Learning Center and Dr. Homer Goon, this is Marie Huggy saying thanks for tuning in. This is Homer Goon, bringing you excellence in dentistry, like no one else can.